Well, as you know, we've been uh, going through a series called Since You Asked, and these are questions that people have posed to us asking about various things uh, that they want to ask about the Bible. And today we're talking about singleness and uh, specifically, you know, what does the Bible have to say about singleness? Uh, What is our theology about singleness? Uh, In light of the fact that we have a church that is full of people who are married and families, and there's a lot of emphasis on marriage and family within the church body. And and I would say that it's actually lopsided. I would say that we typically spend more time and and focus on talking about marriage and on families and children and so on, which is a good thing that we're doing that, of course, but not enough time talking about what does it mean to be single in the body of Christ? What is our role as singles? How do they fit in and so on? So I want to talk about that, and um, uh, I want to give a couple of disclaimers, and that is the word single has a little bit of of baggage associated with it, uh, both sociologically and theologically. Uh, I actually wanted to use the term celibate, uh, and I said, the gift of celibacy, that's what I wanted to title this message today, and I tested that out with a couple of people. I said, "Uh uh-uh, don't use that, uh, because that has some baggage associated with it as well. And, uh, and so I'm using this term single and singleness because it's, it's a word that we all understand. It's a common word. It's not a strange word in any stretch of the imagination. But there are some challenges with it. I want to suggest a couple of them. Uh, first of all, singleness, not always, but quite often has been associated with somebody who is incomplete. Somebody who is, does not have a partner. Somebody who is not married. Uh, somebody who is alone. And, and sometimes we can look at a single person with even a suspicious eye and said, oh, you're not married. And we, we don't say it out loud, but we start to think, oh, okay, I wonder why they're not married. There must be a, a reason uh, for that. And you say, oh, you're 40 years old and you're not married? You seem so nice, you know. And we say these offhanded comments that are actually very damaging and very, uh, they're revealing something about saying that the state of singleness is not is less than desirable. And so we here at the church, we can even do that in a way that says, oh, um, I know somebody just right for you. And so in our, in our desire to be loving and caring, we actually are communicating something that, uh, that isn't true. Now to be sure, there are singles out there that are not happy being single. Uh, you have two types of people. You have people who have who have chosen to be single and they're happy being single and uh, there's, there, this is just the, the choice that they have made. And then there are those who are single because of circumstances. Uh, they could be uh, separated, could be divorced, they could be widowed, uh, they could be a temporary si- situation, it could be a seasonal time where they are single. Uh, there are lots of young adults, of course, that are single. Maybe they're trying to finish off school before they start looking for a spouse. Uh, there's all kinds of other adults of every age, uh, people even in their 80s who have never married and wish that they could have. Uh, there are people that are uh, physically or developmentally unable to get married. There's all kinds of reasons why people are single. Now, the reality is that the number of singles is actually increasing in our country. More and more people are choosing or circumstantial that they are single. Uh, You have about half of all adults 19 and older who are single. That shocked me when I read that stat. So about half of adults, about 7 million adults in Canada who are single and about 14 million plus that are that are married. And then there's that's not including people who are in common law uh, or, or divorced and that kind of thing. And children of course. And so about half of all adults are single. But not only that, for the first time ever in Canada, according to the 2016 census, for the first time that the number of one-person households has surpassed all other types of living situations. So about, that's what the graphs are before you, 28% of households are one person living in that house. And that surpasses all other types. Uh, such as couples with children, couples without children, single parent families, multiple family households, and every other combination you could think of. And so it is a growing demographic and a reality that not only are there increasing number of singles, but increasing number of singles that are living alone. Another reason why I hesitate to use the word the word single, or I wish there was a different word that we could use, is because it has a potential to diminish the beauty of our relationship with the Lord. 
And the reason I say that is because all of us as believers in Jesus Christ are never truly single. There is a deep and profound relationship that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that is the direction that we are going, that we are moving more and more profoundly into that relationship with God. That is our ultimate destination to be an ultimate and absolute communion with God. Amen. Uh, amen. I had a, I had a secretary uh, a number of years ago in a different church who was single, and she had a a very troubled, very difficult background of abuse and, and a brain tumor, and uh, she had AIDS from a, a relationship, and I mean, just on and on, this terrible relationship, or terrible uh, circumstances in her life. But she loved the Lord, and it was so clear and so evident on her life, and she often would talk about being married to God. And it wasn't a, a glib or a, or a syrupy kind of a statement. She actually knew what it meant to have that relationship. And I believe that that is what we are all moving towards, is absolute communion with God. Unfortunately, both the church and secular culture have been guilty of promoting this myth that the most blissful, natural human state is to be with a spouse or at least to be with a partner. Now, the church has never really developed a robust theology of singleness and helping singles to understand that there is fulfillment outside of marriage. And the secular culture continues to pump out all this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, presentation through movies and the like that, and idolize romantic relationships. And even if it isn't a traditional uh, covenantal relationship between a man and a woman, there still is this, this ultimate goal that we all need to strive for, and that is to have a relationship, a romantic relationship with someone else. And so this leaves singles wondering whether it is possible even to have a healthy uh, choice to dedicate themselves completely to God in a loving relationship with Him. So when we make it all about the human family, we actually do ourselves a disservice. Because what we do is we miss out on the grander plot of the narrative of the Bible. And that is God desiring to enter into marriage with humanity. This is what the Bible explicitly states, that the Lamb of God is going to be in a, there's going to be a wedding feast and we as a church will enter into a spiritual marriage with God. And this whole celebration happens in Revelation 19, for example. It says this, Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to Him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and His bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest and pure of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And there, there is a celebration of this joining together of the bride, which is us as a church, joining together in a spiritual marriage with God. This is the ultimate trajectory of our faith. This is where we are headed. This is the, the union that is going to blow away every other union. Even the best covenantal sacred marriage that you can even think of here in this earth is just a shadow of what is going to occur between us and God. It's going to be an amazing experience for us to have that intimacy with God, with the Almighty God. And so singles have a way of actually leading us into that eternal reality. This is the vision that we need to have as we talk about this, uh, talk about this topic. So where in scriptures do we have the fact that singleness is a gift? Well, first of all, you have to think that a gift is something that you actually want, right? Have you ever experienced a gift that you didn't, weren't really thrilled about? Have you ever had that experience? Um, every year in February, there's a group of guys here in the church that get together, and uh, in February, we, we actually watch the Super Bowl. And uh, I don't know why I'm invited, because I only watch one football game a year, and that's on Super Bowl Sunday. And, uh, but these guys uh, get together, and we just have a blast. We typically go to Rob Clausen's place, and uh, we bring all kinds of food, and we celebrate, and we laugh, and we make fun of each other, and, and uh, somewhere in there, there's a football game too. And uh, one of the things that we do is we do a gift exchange. And this gift exchange has rules. 
first rule is, in order to, the, the gift that you're going to bring, don't purposely go out and buy it. Find something in your house, so like a re-gift or something you don't want. Secondly, you have to wrap it up. The more elaborate, the better. Some of these gifts take like 15 minutes to unwrap just because the way it's been wrapped up. And thirdly, the rule is you have to bring it home with you. You can't leave it. <laughs> so, so here we are, we're doing this gift exchange and uh, this past year, or maybe it was two years ago, somebody brought this gigantic picture of their grandparents. And it was huge. And uh, so, I mean, this is the gift, right? Like who, even their own family doesn't want this present. I mean, so, so who's going to want this? So anyways, whoever, we do the gift exchange, the person gets this gift, and uh, of course they don't want it. They know they're supposed to bring it home, but what they did is they, they took off one of Rob's pictures while he wasn't there and exchanged it with this and then took that one. And uh, uh, fortunately for Rob, he discovered just before the guy left. But anyways... Uh, and maybe that's the way you feel about the gift of singleness. It's not for me. I don't want it. Maybe it's better suited for somebody else, but I don't want this gift. Um, isn't a gift supposed to be something that you want? Isn't a gift something that, that uh, illustrates uh, love and, and care and all that kind of thing? Uh, when you think of presence, I'm also going to use the word with a C, not a T, the gift is something that is present, something that is, that is there, that is going to bring something of value to you. But when you think of singleness, it's also, it's, it's more about absence, not presence. I mean, it's the, by very definition, it's something that is missing. I do not have a husband. I do not have a wife. My life is marked by something missing, not by something that of fulfillment. But this is not at all what the scripture teach. It is not reflected in the practices of the church throughout history. The Bible is very clear that singleness and or celibacy is a gift. It is an invitation to dedicate your life, to give your life over completely to the Lord. And this is for those who aren't married or between marriages or young adults who aren't even sure if they're going to get married or perhaps you feel a call to celibacy for your life or perhaps you're celibate right now but you're open to marriage whatever the situation regardless if you are single this is a gift from God this is not uh, something that that is a preamble to the real thing this is not a waiting room this is not a period of failure for you this is not some purgatory that you have to go through in order to get to the, the good stuff. If you are single, this is the gift of God for you right now. God has called you to it. God is giving this opportunity. He's empowering you with his power to live it in Christ. You are not needing to wait for your story to begin. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 7 where where we have this theology about singleness. The letter of Corinthians is Paul, address, Apostle Paul is addressing a number of the concerns that are there in the church. And one of the questions that they were debating in the church uh, at the time was, what is more spiritual? To be married, uh, where there is sexual intimacy, or to be single and to live a life of celibacy? So there's this argument, which is more, which is more spiritual? And Paul answers the question like this, starting at verse 1 of chapter 7. Now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. And so the rest of the chapter, the whole chapter, is really dealing with these two very valid choices that you can make in your life a life that you are choosing to experience sexual intimacy in the covenantal relationship of marriage or to abstain from sex in, uh, in a single lifestyle, celibate lifestyle. So how do you choose? Which, which way do you go? Well, Paul is basically saying it comes down to whatever gift that you have. Some have the gift of marriage, some have the gift of singleness. If you are single, you have that gift. If you're married, you have that gift. And it's a wonderful gift. Both are necessary. Both have their advantages. And Paul says in verse 7, very clearly, he says, but I wish everyone were single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. 
So what are the advantages of being single? Well, he goes on, verse 26. Because of the present crises, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. No, I love that, that line. I mean, I don't know how often you recognize that, but this is the best that Paul has to say about marriage in this whole chapter. If you do get married, it's not a sin. And the, way I, the reason why I like that so much is because it flips it on its end. When we hear uh, in our current cu culture, quite often there is this emphasis on marriage and upon families and upon on having children and so on. Well, this flips it on an end. I would rather you be single. But if you do get married, it's not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles. Uh, and I'm trying to spare you those problems. Anybody here can testify to the fact that there are problems in marriage. Anybody? Anybody admit that? Yeah, I think most of you, if you don't admit it, you're lying or you're dead. Uh, marriage does bring challenges, right? There's no question about it. And uh, Paul is saying, I just want to spare you from those problems. And so he goes on to tell about the advantages of being single. Verse 32. It's a long text here. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. Notice, I want you to be free from the concerns of life. As an unmarried, an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married, can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord with as few distractions as possible. And so Paul is saying singleness is a wonderful gift. <clears throat> It's a gift that gives you singular focus. You are no longer needing to be distracted and needing to deal with the extra stresses and responsibilities that come when you are married and dealing with uh, helping and pleasing your spouse and looking after children and so on. Paul says, I want to spare you this trouble. It's not a sin to get married, but I want you to do what is best so that you can please the Lord. So stay as you are. You know, marry if you have to. But it's going to be a challenge. You won't be able to do everything that a single person can do. And I think we actually need to be more honest about that. Uh, we want to celebrate marriages. I don't want to take anything away from the beauty of marriages. But we also want to recognize that there are challenges that come along with that. Some people go into a marriage with a lot of vision, a lot of dreams, a lot of goals of what they want to do in their life, and then something happens. Either that vision dies or the relationship deteriorates because both are not necessarily always compatible. I think of my, my son Ryan, who's 26 and living in the Philippines, and, and uh, he's open to having a spouse, but as he's talking about it, I hear him very clearly say, this person who I'm going to marry needs to embrace the vision that I believe that God has called to me. And he knows that this would be a difficult thing for him. It just simply wouldn't work unless they were united in this vision. And so we, Paul tells us, let's be honest, count the cost before you get married. And then Paul gets, into, Paul gets this thinking from Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, that we're going to be looking at in a moment. The idea of singleness in the Old Testament is actually not really there. There's no positive alternative that the scriptures give us in the Old Testament about living a celibate lifestyle because children were actually seen as a blessing from the Lord. The more children you have, the more blessing you have, but to be a celibate was not really seen, uh, not validated so much in the Old Testament. But here in the New Testament, we see it as a new standard, a new validity to live a single lifestyle in discipleship and following Jesus Christ. So think about this. God's best method for 
speaking to us as humanity and having a relationship with us was incarnating himself into a human being with all of its desires, with all of the temptations, all of what it means to be human, and incarnate himself into a male virgin, a celibate lifestyle in the life of Jesus. This is what God's intention was. And Jesus comes to validate this, this choice to be a single individual, a legitimate option in our role here on this earth. So if you are single, Jesus wants you to know that you are not broken because you are single. You are not incomplete because you are single. Your life is not defined by absence. It is actually defined by the presence of God. You have everything that you need to be a follower of Christ. In fact, there are things that singles cannot do that married people do. We've already re alluded to that. There are lifestyle things, uh, choices, and, and, and areas that you can go and, and, and some of the things that you can be involved in that married people simply cannot do. And so God is calling, maybe calling you uh, to understand the value and the validity of being single in a lifestyle dedicated to him. Now, of course, there are challenges to this lifestyle. Uh, there may be the temptation to long for a spouse. And there's nothing wrong with desiring a spouse. Nothing wrong with that. But there is a, a, a way in which we can obsess over it, which is actually a kind of rejection of this gift of singleness. We're always looking, always hoping, always thinking that the right person is going to be coming around the corner so that I can be complete and, and have this spouse in my life. And it's a way of actually rejecting the gift that God has given to you. And then, of course, there's this challenge of living a celibate life. In our current culture, uh, where our sexual expression is such a, an important part of who we are, this is our identity, and, and this is any oppression of that or repression of that is actually uh, a, a, you know, an abuse on somebody. You're denying my human right by doing it. And so we live in this kind of culture, this we drink from this cultural nonsense on a regular basis. And when we don't have a clear understanding of what God's call is on our life, then we start to lose out on what it means to be a single, to be a celibate individual. And so that's why, why we, we see the redefinition of marriage happening. This is why uh, premarital sex is a non-issue in our culture. Even among our, our church culture, there still is so much of that happening. And say, oh yeah, everyone is doing it. And so there's no clear sense or no clear understanding of what God has called us to. And it's all based on a false premise that our identity is found in our urges and our sexual makeup and it ignores completely that God has called us for intimacy with him. Now, being a celibate or a virgin does not need to be a naive life or a disengaged life. It can actually be a very engaged life. It can be a period of time to develop immense wisdom and understanding. It is not the time for experimentation or to free yourself from repression but you are called to honor your brothers and sisters and to experience the fullness of God's call on your life. A single person made this comment, that celibacy has to be more than just being able to have a longer quiet time. And that's a fair comment. Uh, there has to be more than just having extra time to read my Bible and to pray. And that's why Jesus invites us not only to singular devotion, but he also calls us to singular mission, to be on mission with him, to be a part of how he is advancing the kingdom. So in Matthew 19, uh, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they try to trap Jesus, asking him a, a, a difficult question about divorce. And Jesus responds referring back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and he says, haven't you read the scriptures? By the way, this is Jesus' way of, of slapping them on the face, so to speak, because he's, these, are, these are Bible scholars. And he says, have you not actually read the first couple of chapters of this book that you say that you know about? 
And he says, uh, they, the, rec the record, they record from that from the beginning that God made them male and female. And he said, Jesus said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So marriage, Jesus says, is one man, one woman, permanence. And he says, don't fool around with that formula. This is the way it is to be. Don't make it more than it is and don't make it less than it is. Don't try to get out of it. So the Pharisees are not happy with Jesus' response, and so they say Moses said that Moses that Moses said that man could divorce his wife. Why did he say that? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, unless his wife has been unfaithful. Verse 10, Jesus continues, uh, sorry, his disciples then said to Jesus, if this is the case, it is better not to marry. And Jesus says, yep, you're right. It's not for everyone. Don't get married if you can't accept this. This is what he says in verse 11. Not everyone can accept this statement. Only those whom God helps. And so this is what Paul is, is grabbing from, what Jesus had said in Matthew 9, that's recorded for us in Matthew 19. And he says, consider the cost of marriage before you get into it. And then Jesus says something very interesting. And he gives an alternate to marriage. Not everyone is called to marriage. Some are called to singleness. And this is what he says in verse 12. Some are born as eunuchs. Some have been made eunuchs by others. And some choose not to marry for the sake of kingdom of heaven. Let, everyone who, let anyone accept this who can. So Jesus says some are born, some are made, and someone choose to be eunuchs. Now, the word eunuch is, is not a, a word that we commonly use, and, and probably you're thinking about castration when you think of, of that word, but it's much more than that. And so Jesus says some are born that way. What does that mean? Well, it could mean a number of things, and I think Jesus is capturing a lot of different things here. I think there are some babies that are born with missing parts, or some of them are born with both male and female parts. We use the word intersex to refer to that today. And there's all kinds of reasons why babies are uh, what's called genital ambiguity, where there's not clarity on whether they're male or female. And so there's those kind of things that do happen. Maybe some people are born asexual, which means that they have no sex drive. Or others would say that people are born with the same sex attraction. And so we have this all kinds of things that can happen that are, there's brokenness in our human DNA, and then people are born with all kinds of different uh, brokenness inside of them. By the way, I believe this includes all of us. Um, if you are heterosexual, do not think that you are not broken sexually. We all are broken sexually. Just because my attraction may be to women, that doesn't mean that I cannot have impure thoughts towards women. So in that sense, none of us are actually straight. We tend to have these dichotomies, straight or gay, and that's actually not a really good way to talk about it, that all of us are broken, all of us are crooked, so to speak, in our, in our sexual desires. And so Jesus says, so some people are, are born in this way. And so uh, not everyone should get married as a result for a whole variety of reasons. And then Jesus said some are made by others. So what does that mean? Well, it's possible that there are those who have experienced sexual abuse and that has also impacted their life uh, to a degree that they wouldn't be able to get married. And then finally, Jesus says that some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom. Now this is the mission that Jesus called us to. Singular mission. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is someone who uh, we recognize from the books on discipleship that he gives and so on. Uh, he never married, although he was planning on getting married near the end of his life. He was killed by the Nazis. Uh, he was only 39 years old 
but Dietrich Bonhoeffer was uh, singularly devoted and, and on mission for God. And he said this, the essence of celibacy, the essence of chastity, is not the suppressing of lust, but the total orientation of one's life toward a goal. It is the giving of ourselves over to the cause of Christ. It is our sacrificing ourselves so that we can be in singular mission with Christ and what he is doing in this world and to join him on advancing the kingdom. Being single does not mean that this is your time to be selfish and, and to do what you want to do. And because I have no dependence, therefore I have more finances and so I can buy things and I can travel more and, and do what I've always wanted to do. That's not what it means. It is a time to give yourself over to the mission of God. Nor is it a place to hide. Some of you may find it difficult to, to have relationships with the opposite gender, and so you just didn't get married because of that reason. And what we need there is healing, not avoidance of the issue. God wants you to bless others and disciple others. You are still a spiritual father and a spiritual mother, regardless if you're single or married. And so a final word that I want to make to those who are not single, for those who are married. We need to be very sensitive and careful that we do not look down upon singles in any way or, or to assume that they are lonely or to assume that they need a spouse, but to validate their choice or the situation that they are in, regardless if it's by choice or by circumstance. Rather, we are to include them in our family gatherings and our celebrations, invite them into our home, also recognize that singles are sexual beings just like everyone else. They have the desires for intimacy. It's just going to look different than in the covenant relationship and a marriage. And so in the context of marriage, there's sexual intimacy, but for a single, it is in different ways through deep sharing, through caring, through time, fun and laughter, sharing life together and touch, uh, non-sexual touch. There's all kinds of uh, examples, just even this past weekend I heard about how meaningful a uh, non-sexual touch can be. Whether it's uh, a touch on the shoulder, whether it's a hug, whether it's holding babies or, or whatever it may be, uh, everyone will be different on what is appropriate for them. But let us not neglect the needs of our singles. And now a word to our singles, again, just to say thank you. Uh, thank you for the sacrifices that you make. Thank you that, that you are serving the Lord here in this context, here in this family, the Glencairn Church. Uh, last week we celebrated women in ministry leadership, and I, uh, we, we recognized that if we had no woman in leadership in our church, our church would crumble, right? Wouldn't that be the case? And I feel the same way about singles, that if it wasn't for your sacrifices, if it wasn't for your leadership, if it wasn't for what you were modeling for us, we desperately need this model in our family. You expand the kingdom. You teach us more about the reflecting the nature of God's expanding love. Thank you for being celibate for the sake of the kingdom and for the work of the church. We need you. We need your example. We need what you model for us. And so we pray that God's blessing would be on you as you serve the Lord with singular mission and devotion. Let's give time to thanks, thank the Lord in prayer. So God, we come before you and we thank you for this amazing gift of yourself that you have given to us. That all of us, regardless of our marital status, we can benefit from because you have given yourself with singular devotion, singular mission, it is a gift that we have received when you died on the cross. You died for people that had no interest in you, that we were your enemies, and yet you still did it with incredible love, with outstanding grace. We definitely did not deserve it, and yet you did that for us. Thank you, Jesus, for modeling what it meant to be a human being, and you did so as a single. 
Thank you for that gift of singleness. You've given us the gift of marriage, which helps us understand what it means to be in relationship with you in that sense. But you've also given us this gift of singleness in which we can be devoted to you and not be distracted, that we can be on mission with you in unique ways that normally we wouldn't be able to do as, as a married couple. And, and you've enabled us to, to rest in this presence and this gift of of, uh, of the spiritual marriage that you have offered to us. And so God, so God help us to, to trust you more, to engage in this life that you have offered to us so that we may be motivated to serve you regardless of our status. And we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.